Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Krishna Das. Krishna Das is known for his ability to transport his audience into other worlds with his deep hypnotic voice fusing traditional kirtan, hope I said that right, of the East with Western harmony and rhythm. KD has developed his own musical style and has been called yoga's rock star because of the artistic layering of traditional art of chanting with instantly accessible melodies and modern instrumentation. Fulfilling his promise to the Maharaji, I will sing for you in the West, Krishna is a worldwide icon and the best-selling Western chant artist of all time. All time. All time. That's because nobody sold, sold chants until I did. <laughs> yeah, but think how great that is. Nobody did it until you did. There has to be someone well, pioneering this, right? They were selling these for thousands of years. They just weren't, uh, they weren't getting people, people weren't paying for it. Yeah, but, but in, the, in the East, it's different. You know, in the East, they support spiritual work. In they, the, they look you to don't do think that. it does yeah. that here? No, but the culture is not built around that. Uh, in the East, you know, sadhus and yogis wander around and they put their hands out and somebody feeds them. That doesn't happen here. So it's yeah. a different, it's a different model. So uh, yeah. it just works that way here. Did you have a hard time getting it accepted here, given all of that? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, I wasn't trying to be accepted. I just was trying to save my app. Well, sometimes that leads and, to acceptance. Well, it, something happened, but, you know. And uh, so that's why I started chanting, because I needed to do that for myself. And the practice involves other people. So I was, it was very clear to me. I had this epiphany that I had to sing with people. And it was very clear. It was very much with people and not alone in my room. So, uh, so yeah, you know, it was just, it just happened all naturally. There was no plan. This was not a career move. You know, this was a, a survival move and it just turned into something else completely. Yeah, but you do believe you're on your path. Yes. That the, that Excuse the, me. The, you do believe you're on your path that the universe. Oh, no, of course. So, I mean, it's exactly the same for me as it always been. I'm it, chanting. To it's enter interesting into that. how you've gone from, you know, this young man growing up in a Jewish family on Long Island. About and as then, Jewish as the Pope. Well, but still, they were a Jewish family. They weren't, they didn't practice Hinduism or anything like that, which I know, you know, you've said that you don't attach to that either. Is that true? That you're I, all religions no. and no religion? Yeah, I don't identify with any particular religion at all. So how did you- I, I identify very much with the saints that started those religions, but with the organization of religions, I don't have anything to do with that. How did you wind up in India initially? Uh, just good karma. <laughs> well, uh, the, the details are that I met Ramdas when he first came back from India on his first trip. And uh, so that, that was life changing. And then after about a year and a half of hanging out with him in the States, uh, in the summer of 1970, I went over to India to meet the guru. What, do you, what does it mean to be a guru? I mean, that's sometimes that term it's, you know, people here think it's just like this horrible word, but what does it really mean to you? Guru, God, and self are one. They're not two, they're not different. Real guru is someone who's directly experienced the oneness of all life, the oneness of all beings, the oneness with the universe. There's no separation, there's only one. They don't do business, they don't need anything, they don't want anything, they don't manipulate people. And on the other hand, they can do whatever they want because everything they do is based only on one motivation, which is compassion for us. That's a real guru. And a real guru, again, is not something different than your own true nature, your, your soul. They're not another person. That being may manifest in a physical body for a while, but they're not attached to that. They're not identified with that. It's just the car that they're driving around. When it gets old, they throw it away and get another car. So guru is not outside of us. And people who, people who have a negative reaction to that word 
are having a negative reaction to what Westerners have turned gurus into, which are uh, people who just do business. Gurus are not teachers. They just change you. They don't even ask. They just do it because they know what's right for you more than you do for yourself. So do and you when you, meet, the, the gurus when you meet someone like that, uh, uh, it, it's life-changing completely. Do you think a guru is an ascended master as well? Are they one I, and the same or are they different? I don't know. It depends on, I, I don't know much about the qualities of what you call an ascended master. Uh, Every being has a role to play in, in creation in the whole world, you know, and different people play different roles, different beings. Someone who was, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, I don't really know much about those beings who you, you call the ascended masters. I wouldn't know a real guru if I tripped over him in the street anyway, because we don't know until we become. It's not something you, you study, it's something you become. And when you become, then you know. So I can't, I can't evaluate any, any other being. I can't even evaluate myself. So I just uh, try to keep singing. <laughs> so while you were in India, you began to chant. What yeah. were you chanting and what are you chanting now? I'm chanting pretty much the same thing what's called in India, the divine names, the names of God. You know, they know there's only one God but that God manifests as everything. And if you, and, and there are certain beings who have become doorways into the infinite, so to speak. And by connecting with them, you can move right, they can help you move right through into that infinite reality. So in India, they have what they call the Hindu gods, but really we don't know what that means. What do we, what's a God? What do we don't know what it means? We have a word in English, God, a God. That's different from God, a God. So, but we don't know what that means because we can't know anything outside of our conceptual reality with our minds. And a great being like that is beyond anything we can imagine or think about. So to use these words is very tricky and Westerners just adopt things and they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I remember I once was doing a, a retreat <laughs> and I was in a very cranky mood that, that weekend. I don't know why. So some woman that I know in the group started to say, I do my job as Seva. And I said, stop. You know, stop. What are you talking about? You get paid? Yeah. Then it's not Seva. You know, Seva, what she was trying to say was selfless service. You know, serve ego, ego less service, ego, desireless action, which Krishna says is karma yoga. That's called karma yoga. But we, we human beings do, do not have desireless action because everything we do has some motive, even if it's a pure motive, like to realize God or to, to serve humanity, serve others. There's, there is a motive there. It's not your, your doing. And you think of yourself as the doer, even subtly. So I got, so they started making t-shirts that weekend saying, I survived the Krishnadas retreat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> I was very cranky that day. Well, that's okay. But, I um, people hear you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, so you're chanting. How has it healed you? And how do you think it heals other people to listen to it? What comes through? My guru comes through. That, that's what people feel. That's what I feel. And that's who I, that's what I sing to. That loving presence within, which is now for me, my guru who has left the body. So I can't find them outside. So I sing to him everywhere. And, uh, and in everything and everyone. So that I sing to that loving presence and that's what people feel, they feel something pulling them in pulling them giving them some kind of uh, positive feeling and uh it's immediate it's not a you, you don't really think about it it just happens you know I've, people tell me they were like they were in some bookstore in the old days 
and they heard some music on the speakers and they were just mesmerized. What is that? And they went, went and they had to find out what it was. You know, it calls you, it just calls you home. The chanting calls you home. Does it bring up any heartache or suffering that, you know, people need to look at? It can do that. Yeah. So it can bring up a lot of stuff, but, <clears throat> But the way the practice is done is very simple. You chant, you pay attention to the sound of the chant. And when you notice that you haven't been paying attention, you come back. That's the whole practice. So in that moment when you're gone in something, some dream or some memory or some fantasy or some imagining or some emotional replay, uh, you notice that. And the minute you notice it, you're actually out of it already. And at that moment, you come back. You've, you've, you've woke up from that dream. And then you take your attention back to the sound of the name. And every time you come back and rededicate yourself to listening to the sound that you're making and maybe the people around you are making and I'm making, they say that a neural pathway in the brain is deepened. And it gets a little bit easier, Min you know, minutely every, every time you come back, because we're coming back to ourself, our thoughts, emotions, imaginings, all that stuff, they take us away. They take us away from ourselves. And the chant is the name of that place inside of us. So that creates this magnetism, which pulls us out of the dreams and out of the stories that we tell ourselves and frees us from that stuff. And it also gives us the strength to let go of that stuff. You know, therapy, counseling is very useful for a lot of people. I did a lot of that. But the strength to actually let go of this stuff, to release the energy that's bound up and, and that we cling, gets us clinging to that stuff, the strength to release that comes from the practice, the practice of letting go and releasing again and again and again. It, it's, uh, it's a ripening process, really, more than anything. So you're, when you chant a name, is it about the name or is it about the vibration of the name? I don't know. Well, is, is it, does it connect to a chord in somebody's body vibrationally? Or is it just, is it every sense? Or is it just what they hear? Because we all hear things differently. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think every, everybody experiences it differently. But they're seeing, they're, they're, they're experiencing the same thing, but differently. It's just like when you look at a painting. One person will see, oh, the beautiful colors. Other person will see what's, what is being painted, or somebody will see the, the frame of the painting. You know, everybody sees the things. We all see things. We all see the same things differently, but we're seeing the same thing. Like in the West, God is the name for God. In India, there's a million names for God. In Africa, there are other names. There's only one God that we're talking about, but different names according to culture, according to emotional shape, etc cetera, etc cetera. so you asked me a question like that but i don't i don't even think about those things that's beyond my pay grade this is not nadi yoga this is not the yoga of sound which is a practice that people can do this is chanting this is love this is this is this is what you want you don't want to be a yogi you want to be love if you think being a yogi is going to get you love go for it but why not go right to the love? You know, before I went to India, I was meditating. I was doing asana and pranayama, all these things. When I met Maharaji, I just forgot all that stuff because I was living in it. I, I was swimming in it. What am I going to do? What do you need a, a, a raft to, when you've already got to the other shore temporarily? You know? So how do you live without him in your life now? Or do you feel him around you always? Like, how did you deal with his passing? <clears throat> ah, well, you're, you know, I didn't deal with it very well. I had become very attached to his physical presence. 
completely attached to civic awareness. I, it, it, it's funny when I first, when I met him first was the first time I met Ramdas. I walked into the room and without, even without eye contact or a word being spoken, I knew, and I was a pretty messed up kid, but I, at that moment, uh, moment, I knew that whatever it was I was looking for, and I didn't know what to call it, but whatever it was, it was real. And it was in the world and you could find it. And that changed my life, completely changed my life. So what do you say to people now who want a similar experience? Can they have it? They can have their own experience. They can't have mine. No, no. I already had it. <laughs> but you don't have to go off to India to experience. No, of course not. And besides, it's different these days anyway. Back in those days, there was no, there weren't even telephones in most places. You were lucky if you had a telephone line. Now everybody and his brother has a two mm -hmm. mobile phones. You know. Um, no, of course, you don't have to go anywhere. But at that time in America and in the world, what I needed to do is to be with, well, from my side, I'll tell my side of the story is what I wanted to do was be with the guru, meet the guru, because he was in a body and he was available. So <clears throat> after he left the body for 20 years, or most for 11 years, I was completely, destroyed. I, I was living in despair and total desolation. Although on the outside, it might not have looked to, like that because I'm good at giving people what they want to see. But inside I was dying. And more than that, I was even trying to kill myself in uh, indirect ways. And uh, it was very, very bad, very, very ho horrible. I felt I had lost the only the only way that I was ever happy. I, I, there's, there was no possibility. Where was I going to find it? It was gone, right? So it was very, very dark times for me. And um, but eleven years into that, I went back to India. I had been back already many times. And I had an experience that was like being born again. Like it was like, <laughs> okay, let the kid live. You know, it was like that. And so from that point on, I started to open up again. I started to work on my stuff. That's when I started doing some counseling and stuff like that. Um, but then another 11 years went by. And that's when everything really changed for me. That, that's when I was, where Maharaji really came back to me and everything changed uh, completely. Within those 22 years, were you still chanting? No, I hadn't started chanting uh, until I came back from India. No, in 1994, I started chanting with people, which was 21 years after he died, after he left the body. But I had been chanting a little bit with people I knew from the old days. We'd get together sometimes every weekend. But the way I was doing it, it wasn't, I wasn't doing it as practice. I wasn't doing it as, it was just rubbing salt in a wound. You know, it wasn't, there was nothing, there was nothing in it for me at that time. It was all show in a way. So where did you have to get to that it changed? Okay, well, in 1990, so in 1994, I was standing in my room in New York and I had another epiphany. And I understood that if I did not sing with people, I would never be able to clean out the dark shadows and the corners in my own heart. There was no, I had no other way. This was all that was given to me. And if I didn't do it, it wasn't going to happen. And the understanding was that those shadows were the only thing that was causing me suffering, of which there was a lot of suffering. So I had to start singing with people. I started doing that. But after about nine months, 
<clears throat> I o over the first nine months, I began to see that um, that I couldn't do it right. I, I, it wasn't gonna, I, I couldn't do it. And uh, I was gonna use all, the, I could see what was gonna happen. It was already happening. People were coming towards me. Energy was coming towards me. Everything was coming towards me. And I was a hungry guy. And I was gonna use all this attention and energy to satisfy my hungry desires. And there was no possibility that I wasn't gonna do that. And I was horrified because that's not why I started to chant. I started to chant to reconnect from my side with Maharaji again, because I had left him. He had never left me for a second, but I had left him. I had let go of his hand. And he used to say, he used to say, once I take a hold of your hand, I never let go, even when you let go of mine. So I knew he was with me, but I had, I had betrayed that connection, so to speak. And I was trying to reestablish myself in his presence again, you know, in a different way. But I saw I couldn't do it because my own desires were gonna ruin everything. So <clears throat> I quit, I quit singing and I went to India. And it's funny, I arrived on the spring solstice, 1995. And I left on the summer solstice, three months later. But just before I left, I had a very deep experience, a life-changing experience where uh, he showed me what, what, it's like he parted the curtains and I saw the way things really are. Oh, and it was wonderful. You know why? Because it wasn't about me at all. Because I was thinking all this, all this energy and chanting were coming to me and it was all about me and people wanted me, right? And then I saw, it's not about me at all. They, people want this, the connection to him, to that love, forget about him but to that love and to themselves. And that's what they feel. They think it's coming from me. That's their delusion. That's fine. They can have that. I don't care what. They, but I had the same delusion, but he freed me of that. And at one, at one point in the middle of this very powerful experience, I looked up in the sky. And up in the sky, I saw like a little thickening of the atmosphere, right? It's like, and in that little thickening, there was like whirling, 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 whirling around, little millions of little things whirling around, making a little. And I looked up and I laughed and I said, that's Krishna Dasness. All that, and there were thoughts. And what they were, were me, 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 me thoughts. And I saw very clearly that when I think I'm Krishna Das, I think I'm Krishna Das. When I don't, then what? Then there's no, there's no separate being there at all. There's just the universe, ultimate peace, ultimate space, ultimate silence and, and total gentle, sweet love everywhere. And, that's, and, and there's no one there. But, but when I saw, when I think I'm Krishna, I really think I am. So that freed me. Because I saw, even when I'm stupid and I think I'm me, I'm not. So is that how you feel when you chant? Do you feel that, like, do you feel like you leave your body? And no, you're just I'm, I'm, just, I'm just there. I, I don't have any thoughts like that. I'm just singing. You know, I, people, a lot of times people ask me, what do you experience when you chant? I said, I don't know. I don't pay attention to it. I just sing. I'm not trying to make anything happen. I'm trying to just pay attention to the sound and to move into the sound. Whenever something pulls me out, I let go and I come back. That's my practice. I'm doing my practice. I'm not manipulating people or creating 
trying to give anybody any kind of experience. I'm sharing my practice with whoever wants to show up and sing. So do you chant every day? Yeah, a little bit every day. Yeah. Has, Sometimes has I don't you, chant out loud. Sometimes I do, you know, quiet chanting mentally. Has your practice changed over the years? Um, yeah, for sure, definitely. There's less me in it. Do you, do you hear <laughs> do you hear the Maharaji? Do you feel the presence? Not enough. It won't be enough until oh, I'm sitting enough. in his lap. Until I'm sitting in his lap. That's when it won't be enough. Then it'll be enough. Well, how has but he he's in charge of that. But that see, that's okay, even though I don't like it. It's okay because it's not my job. My job is just to sing and remember him, so to speak. There's a beautiful word in India, bhajan, which also is a song, but it's a song of remembrance of God. It's about that. But it also means to remember. There's this beautiful idea of just to remember the love, remember to look, to remember to see what's go what it is. And when you remember, then you're, you're not gone in your stuff. You're remembering. It's not the past you remember. You remember this moment to be here. Yeah, that's come very back. hard for human beings, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Well, well, what do you mean? It's not unfortunate. It's just the karmic situation. It's all, uh, we each live in our own, we each live in our own uh, karmic garden. And, and we're, you know, our job is to pull out the weeds and grow the good flowers. And, uh, but uh, yeah. This, the suffering is very unfortunate, of course, but it's not anybody's fault. It's mm. not like anybody's doing this to us. It's our own minds. You know, th that's where the suffering is. You know, the same per two people can have the same experience and have a completely different reaction to it or live with it in a completely different way, as you know. So. It's our minds and our programming, our karmic, emotional programming that is determined in, has determined this moment. Now, in this moment, we have plenty of choices to make. If we're able to even make choices, most of us just react blindly our whole lives, and then we're dead. <laughs> and we get to do it again, I guess. But in this moment is when we have, we have an opportunity to plant the seeds that we want to see grow, you could say. So do you think your music can help change people within there to be in the present, to remember? Does it open up something inside? I mean, I know that you just let it happen, that there's no desire, but have you seen people change? Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I've changed. I mean, definitely there's, like I said, there's less of me in the chanting and more chanting. Uh, there's less agenda as time goes on and and people feel that maharaj i i just have to say it the way i it, i think about it which is they feel the presence of this love which happens to be what i call my guru and when you feel that it's it's not up here you feel it right here and you go ah you know it's like it's not a and it's not it's non-denominational it, it doesn't have to be my guru. I don't put pictures of him up usually when I go to sing with people because everybody has their own guru, their own this or on that. Fine. That's the way it should be because the love is formless. It's in all the forms. It's not one, there's not one way that's better than another way. The way you go is the best way for you, whatever that is. So, you know, that being said, when you teach people how to chant, so, so, when you that? people how to chant or you tell them about how they can practice it on their own how can you do that if it's so individual because the practice is very simple individuals experience it differently but it's this, exactly the same practice for everybody you chant and when you notice you're not paying attention you chant so what do you chant whatever the hell you want 
you know, that what I chant is what they call the names of God in India. And I also chant some Tibetan mantras. But, uh, and I also sing some gospel songs. Uh, but I would suggest that you chant something that's known to be helpful. If you chant Frank, you know, 24 hours a day for three years, you know, all you'll see is Frank everywhere and Frank and God have not quite met yet. So you wanna transcend the mind. You wanna, you wanna be releasing the thoughts. So you pick one of these names that is known to have power, to have the power to call you home again and again and again, home to your own heart, not somebody else's heart, not somebody else's way, your own way. Everybody's path is unique to them, even though on another level, it's exactly the same path. Mm, that's interesting. What, what instruments do you play when you chant? Mostly I play harmonium, which is like a little keyboard from India. And the other one is this uh, ektar. You're very smart. I can see segueing over here. Okay. This is something I found in, a, in an old hut up in the mountains many years ago. So are there, 19... I can't really see. Uh, are there strings on it? Or is it yeah, just... There's, there's two strings here. See? Oh, I see them. And the two pegs up here. And that's the thing. Very simple so you taught yourself how to play that? Uh, I can show you. What, well, you won't be able to see too much, but I'll see here. I don't know if it'll sound good. Uh, that's okay. Up from these mics, but whatever. Okay. We'd love to hear you play something. Okay, I'll, I'll sing a little. I'll sing a few mantras to the goddess. How's that? Mm-hmm. 
That was so incredible. I mean, I still feel it moving through my body. Really beautiful. I mean, I'm hoping that everybody who listens to this can hear it as clearly as I heard it, that the audio works because it's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, you know, this is, this is what I've been blessed to be able to do is to sing to that place. And that's what I want to do. That's what I do. So will you do this until the day you can do it no more? <laughs> you know, my Siddhi Ma, who was Maharaji's great devotee and who took care of us for 30 years after he left the body. And she lived 35 years more, almost 40 years. Anyway, so she used to always ask me about my health, you know. She always said, you should take rest and take care of yourself. Don't tour too much. You know, don't sing one day and then rest for two days. You know, she was always help trying. So <clears throat> one day she asked me about my health. I said, Ma, you know, I just want to be healthy enough to chant. And she was quiet for a minute, you know, and she looked at me and she said, well, Krishna Das, she said, if and when the time comes that Maharaji no longer requires your service, it's like a promotion. <laughs> I don't want a promotion. Leave me alone. I want to sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you continue to do this for a very long time. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. You are a wonderful being and a wonderful soul, and you are blessing and bringing that love to so many people. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Take care. Namaste.